Well, uh, as you know, um, I study uh, I study social democratic uh, party governments in South America and Europe, and I use a different approach from the one representing the conventional wisdom, and that's what I intend to show you. Uh, Social democracy has been described uh, by political science literature implicitly or explicitly in a very similar way as the conventional wisdom. Uh, the characteristics of this definition is the one we know very well. Uh, increasing duration, social democracy is not left-wing anymore, it turned into center-left. Uh, social democracy stopped to fight against capitalism and nowadays it supports capitalism. And the difference between social democracy and market liberalism are only residual, are not very important at all. And I think this approach has two important uh, analytical problems. First of all, it blurs the difference between left and right, the persisting difference, and it limits the perceived scope of what social democratic uh, parties are able to do nowadays. Yes. Um, the most influential responsible for this approach is Adam Chevorsky with his book Capitalism and Social Democracy. Chevorsky describes uh, social democracy as a historical phenomenon. In the beginning there was the acceptance of democracy by the socialists, so there was the option for reforms instead of the revolution, besides the acceptance of coalitions as the industrial worker class was not the majority of the people. And so there was the option for relative and cumulative reforms. Uh, in the first moment, the, the, he, he states, the socialists did not have in their political program an economic policy of their own to implement in government. So the first socialist governments adopt the same orthodox uh, economic policies of their contenders, except for a little more emphasis on social policies. This situation changed in the 30s when they adopted Keynesianism, redefining the rule of the state. There's no problem in this analysis, which seems to be very accurate. The problem is that Chevorsky views a change in, of the goal as a characteristic of social democracy. According to him, social democracy changed its aim. It does not intend to abolish capitalism, but only to humanize the capitalism. He states that as state interventions must be guided by economic efficiency, social democracy governments started to care more about the perverse effects of capitalism than with reformism itself, which would have lost its cumulative effect. Um, I propose a different approach. My definition of social democracy is this one. A socialist and partisan politics that aims to advance in the transformation of the production system, turning it more favorable to the workers and those that are excluded, which compose social democratic parties for constituency. Still as part of this, of this definition, in contrast to Marxism-Leninism, social democracy emphasizes the core importance of representative and parliamentary democracy, as it refuses the option of the the option for violent revolution, it acknowledges that there are constraints to the socialist advance, which impacts in its speed. So there is no dichotomy between socialism and social democracy, as is usually stated. Social democracy is a kind of socialism. So social democracy necessarily implies both social economic concerns and electoral and parliamentary democracy. This does not mean that cultural identity and post-materialist concerns cannot be also an important part of the agenda of many social democratic parties. It also does not mean that the parliament is seen as the only important locus for politics. Indeed, many of the social democratic parties have important participation in social movements and support the coexistence of other and more direct ways of democracy. 
This approach refuses both the idea that there are no more differences between left and right in the way they deal with the economy, and the idea that nowadays the core differences are the ones related to post-materialist issues, like what Kitchell states. <coughs> the approach I, I, I defend can be represented as a conflict of synthesis between two important authors from the German Social Democratic Party, Karl Kautsky and Edward Bernstein. Both agree in some core elements, but also have important disagreements, which exist inside all social democratic political parties that are divided in two wings, a pragmatic one and a purist one. Both Kauski and Bernstein agree that representative parliamentary democracy has a core importance for the transformation of the production system towards one more favorable to workers and to those who are excluded, who, as I have, have already said, compose the social demo democracy's core constituency. Liberal democratic institutions are seen as a tool for socialist policies. The state is not viewed necessarily as an anti proletarian institution, as many Marxists do, because it changes its, its character when the representatives of the people are in, in power. That's the idea. There are situational constraints to a faster advance of socialism. In a democracy, a party cannot simply impose its program by force, so the result is a gradative reformism. My, my definition is close to that of the classic authors of social democracy. Przewodzki's definition states that social democracy is another thing, another thing nowadays. I think that if it had changed all its characteristics, there would be no sense to still call it social democracy. Simply, it would not exist anymore. I think that a better approach is to keep with a more general concept of social democracy that has always been the same. Of course, if the external conditions change, the answers will also change, and therefore will also change the outcomes. But the general goal, the motivation, and the democratic values are still the same as they have always been. The relative reformism is adopted in the midst of the internal conflict between the Bernstein pragmatism and the Kautskian purism. And what, what concerns to Bernstein and pragmatism, as it does not have a very well-defined long-term goal, it may be confused with the right-wing opponents. On the other hand, uh, as the Kautskian purism refuses coalitions, it's a, it's a problem because sometimes these coalitions not only would not avoid deep reforms, but also would make these reforms feasible. These two poles are alive and in permanent struggle, in permanent struggle inside the social democratic parties. If one of them becomes too weak, there will be the risk that the party changes not to be really social democratic anymore turning itself to a purely off-seeking party, or insulating itself as a ghetto party. Of course, social, de social democracy is an ideal type, so parties can be more or less social democratic. Indeed, they used to be composed by politicians with heterogeneous ideological positions. So we can call them social democratic or not in broad terms, as we consider them close or not to the ideal type. So, the self-definition as social democratic is not important at all. Uh, there are social democratic parties which refuse this label, and there are liberal parties which call themselves social democratic. Besides that, a party can change itself through the history. It can be born as a Marxist revolutionary party, for example, and then turn to a social democratic party, and afterwards turn to a, a liberal or to a non-ideological office-seeking party. In this approach, the assumption is that the main goal of social democratic politicians is not to be re-elected or to take part of the government, but to implement policies. It's a policy-seeking approach, different from the most common assumption in political science. For the specific study of how the democratic left is working for change in the society, in my opinion, it's a more useful approach. Of course, there can be criticisms like, oh, but 
uh, there are politicians that are really more interested in being re-elected and they only defend uh, left-wing policies just to get votes. Or the parties are much more concerned on getting the, the power than on changing the society. My answer is the same as all the other approaches give. So, they are out of my model. My model talks about, about social democracy, about democratic socialism. And those that do not fit are simply not really social democratic in my definition. In the same way as rational choice only applies to rational, rational individuals, and that non-rational or non-utility maximizing behaviors do not fit in the model. So, uh, what does moderate, moderateness mean? I defend that moderateness and lack of deepness in the reforms are not a trait of social democracy, like states the conventional wisdom, but outcomes influenced by specific circumstances. Fortunately, I'm in good company. Espin Anderson uh, told that what distinguishes reformists from revolutionaries is the strategy and not the goal. Bernard Manin told that the difference between the peaceful social democratic culture and the violent Leninist culture is the option for the large or the short term. And so, the diminishing speed of reforms does not mean necessarily that they became less important or that they were abandoned, as states Chevorsky. It is possible that simply there are no situational conditions for its advance. Uh, in Clevelin's allegory of the cave, the prisoners inside the cave could only see shadows in a wall, and they thought that the shadows were the reality and not its reflex. Only when one of them could go out of the cave, it was possible to see the reality, and so he went back and told the others that the shadows were only what reality seemed to be and not what it actually was. Of course, I'm not saying I know the truth as Platon thought about himself. But I'm highlighting that, that it's possible that political science is only describing shadows instead of, instead of looking for important elements outside the cave. Of course, everyone can see moderateness in social democratic policies. But we need to investigate the degree of moderateness and how much the constraints are responsible for this moderateness. But the situational conditions themselves are not given by God or something like that. The contending players are also able to change them. So, to understand the social democratic parties, it is useful to study specific efforts that have been made in each country to change the constraints in order to keep with the reformist advance. I identify two main research lines inside this approach I advocate for. One is focused in internal struggles between purist and pragmatic wins inside the social democratic parties. There are different sources where we can investigate it, like the party meetings, the building of cabinets, uh, the historical process of expelling the radicals. Uh, this line seems to be especially important as we are seeing all the world the emergence of radical democratic left-wing parties opposing to social democratic governments. The other research line in which I am more interested at this moment is the analysis of the constraints the social democratic parties face the challenge is the empirical measurement of these limits and of the achievements of these parties in government relative, relatively to the previous right-wing governments. Yes. There are different kinds of constraints, and all of them can be emphasized in a study of social democracy. First of all, the correlation of forces between the political parties. Besides that, the need or not to build coalitions with other parties, what depends on the creation of force, depends on the electoral system, things like that. Besides that, traditional theoretical heritage of each specific social democratic party, sometimes they may constrain the, the options of policies. There are in some countries where the ethnic issues are very more important than others, the states more present, and things like that. Um, besides that, how much the party is able to intervene in legislation? That depends on many things. For example, if the party is not is in, the, in government or in opposition, if it controls or not the agenda, if it's able to approve legislation without controlling the executive, 
If controlling the executive is enough to implement policies despite not having the majority of the seats in parliament, that depends on the institutional framework of the country. Another constraint is the economic power of the country and its insertion in the international economy. Another one, how much politics merit in each country? That is, the degree of responsibilities of the state in each country. And uh, the last one uh, I can mention now, it's the proportion of clients and potential supporters of social democratic policies in each country. There are places where the middle class has been co-opted with public services. In other places uh, where uh, middle class wants a thinner state because it looks for its welfare in the private market. So of course the constraint is much higher for social democracy. So, what is useful to investigate is if the social democratic parties in government, or also in opposition, are going as far as possible according to the specific constraints. And also to investigate if they are working to change these constraints. If they are really clearly advancing less than it would be possible, so they probably are not social democratic anymore. If they do not have impressive outcomes, but the constraints are too high, we can conclude that they are going as far as it's possible in the specific situational constraints. Um, if you get specifically the correlation of forces as the variables of the constraints in our study, we can see this approach in this way. If the opposition is weak and the, government, and the, the social, social democratic party is also weak, we will have a strong government a strong coalition government, but with an ideologically diluted program because the, the partners in the coalition will be too strong and the social democratic party not so strong. If we have uh, a strong opposition and a, a weak social democratic party, so there's the, the, the worst situation for social democracy because the parties will be unable to implement social democratic policies. Uh, if you have a weak opposition and a strong social democratic party is the most favorable situation for the social democratic advance. And if both are strong, the social democratic party and the opposition, there will be a polarization between the two contending programs, a right-wing program and a social democratic program. So a challenge is to develop variables to measure the constraints for the social democratic advance. I think the ratio of seats controlled by the Social Democratic Party is a variable that catches how strong is the party and how much it is able to adopt a pure program and how much important are the parties in the coalition. In the second path, I think that calculating the ratio of seats controlled by opposition is a good way of measuring the strength of opposition and the constraint for the government to implement its policies. The first difficulty is that is that, as Lever and Scofield emphasize, not all the parties outside government are necessarily in opposition. There is not only the government coalition, but also legislative coalitions, which are often informal. That, that is why minority governments are possible. Sometimes, although a party is outside government, the policies implemented by the government are considered by, by this party better than the status quo. And the points advocated by other parties in opposition are considered by them as even worse than those advocated by, by the government. So we need to know very well the specifics of each study the country, as we can identify how many seats really compose the opposition. This is an, an example, a tentative example, just to illustrate the point. Um, Brazilian uh, Workers' Party movement is clearly in the first, in the first quarter. Uh, there is a very weak opposition, but also the party is not so weak. Brazilian politics is very fragmented. So we can expect that the policies will be very diluted. If the government can, can have strong advances, a clearly social democratic advance, that, that there will be a very positive for social democracy because the, the constraints are not so, so low. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the, the Labour government more or less can be fit in the, the most favored 
favorable situation because the party alone has more than 53% of the, the seats. The point is that the opposition also is, uh, has many seats and if we, we think that probably to, to win the, the, the majority of the seats in, with this electoral system, the Labour Party may, may, may need to moderate the, the policies before being elected. So maybe it will be somewhere close, closer to Brazilian quarter. Uh, the situation for German Social Democratic Party is more ambiguous uh, because it's, it has a, a great share of, of seats alone, but also the positions have a great share of seats. So with more, more political parties, maybe this, it will be clearer to, 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 to compare the parties in the, in the space. I, I, I talked about the constraints now. It's time to talk about outcomes. Um, with all constraints and all outcomes, I think it's, it's very nice to use a kind of a graph like this. Um, of course, we can see this skewed line represents what we expect from a social democratic government. If the constraints are high, the outcomes will be lower. If the constraints are low, the outcomes will be higher. Of course, if we had something different like this, for example, low constraints and low outcomes, there will be a failure of the social democratic government. It will, it will not be a really social democratic government. The other situation would be a, a surprise, a success beyond the expected. Besides, there, there are high constraints, the outcomes are also high. Uh, one of the most important outcomes to be analyzed is the redu reduction of unemployment that, according to Fritz Schaaf, uh, are the top pri pri priority of social democratic parties. There is a consensus among the specialists that expansionist and cyclical fiscal policies that lead to high inflation, uh, inflation are not a feasible way to heat up the economy in order to create jobs anymore as they were in post-war. There is also a, a consensus that there is a need to be attractive to international investors, or they will decide to invest in other countries as the econ world economy is integrated. Um, as some authors, as Car Carlos Bosch and Geoffrey Garrett state, there is another efficient economy strategy to attract the investors besides the neoliberal one. While the neoliberal strategy aims to reduce the costs for the investors, reducing taxes, wages, and benefits, the social democratic strategy looks for increasing the returns without reducing the costs for the investors. So, investing in infrastructure and in human capital. Investing in human capital means to improve education and workers' skills. Doing this, the investors will still have interest in keeping the investments, although they have to pay higher wages to the skilled workers and higher taxes. And this higher tax can be used in public services in, and in the commodification policies. The, uh, the idea of the commodification we owe to Eskin Anderson. Individuals must be decommodified in relation to the market, that is, they must be emancipated from the market dependency. It means that social rights must be related to citizenship and not to individual efficiency and production in the market and not to individual capacity to pay a tax. This is a challenge to social democratic governments and we also must study it. Measuring the outcomes is also a great challenge for the research, for the researcher in this approach. We are not interested for example, in measuring the unemployment in Sweden and Bolivia. It does not help. The important here is to research how the social democratic government has advanced in relation to the previous government. But there are still other problems. When we compare different governments, they do not happen at the same time, of course. And the situation of no conditions may vary among countries and among 
and also between the present government and the previous government in the same country. So how to solve this? Um, reading a book on unemployment, whose author is a Brazilian economist called Márcio Pockman, I had an insight that may help in this puzzle. He says that between 1990 and 1998, Brazil increased from 2.65% of the economically active population in the world to 3.12%. But in the same period, Brazilian increase in the ratio of unemployed and employed workers has been much more serious, from 1.68% of the unemployed to 5.61%. Trying to get this kind of variables, although difficult, is a good solution for our aim. The common problems faced by all the, the world have no impact in the variables if they are relative to the other countries at the same time. They also make it possible to compare different social democratic governments in the same, in the same country, or social democratic governments from different countries that have not happened at the same time. As we compare social democratic governments relatively to the previous governments in the same country, specific advantages or disadvantages of the country relative to the rest of the world do not disturb our analysis either. To conclude, social democracy is not a concept that is dead, that belonged only to the Second International or to the post-war in Western Europe. The concept is as useful as it was before. And it's, it's also useful to different continents, especially to nowadays left-wing Latin American party governments. Kautsky and Bernstein studied the constraints for democratic socialism and the possibilities of that time. We political scientists must do the same. To understand social democracy nowadays, we need to analyze the constraints and possibilities of our time.